Today we're going to continue the fascinating tale of the changing Greek pronunciation through the millennia. And today we're going to talk about the letter eta, as it's called in English, or eta in modern Greek. Now to truly appreciate everything you're about to hear, well, you should learn ancient Greek, and there's no better way than with the Ancient Language Institute. I've had the honor of being with ALI since its earliest days, and the thing that really drew me to ALI is the fact that it's not courses based on grammar translation. You learn all the grammar you need, but you also learn all the vocabulary, and you learn how to be a fluent reader, and you do that through reading, through listening, and through speaking. ALI's instructors use input-based methods, and they'll be able to guide you to fluency in your target language, whether it's ancient Greek, Latin, Old English or Hebrew. Now the deadline to sign up for summer classes is April 15th. That's coming up real soon. So if you have the time, it's an absolutely life-changing experience to finally become a fluent reader of Latin or ancient Greek. It certainly has been for me it completely changed my outlook on the world and how I appreciate literature in general. Particularly because I experience ancient Greek and Latin a lot like I experience living languages. To me, they're spoken. To me, they're heard. To me, they are active and alive in just the same way. And if you want to have that kind of immersion experience, then ALI's online classes might be one of the best ways to do that. But ALI is doing even better this summer with a 10-day full immersion ancient Greek Bible camp. You'll be speaking Koine and classical Greek all day long. That Bible camp is going to be in Eugene, Oregon this summer. For more, go to ancientlanguage.com. Thanks so much to all my dear friends over at the Ancient Language Institute. Now, this video continues the series where I've been talking about the changing pronunciation of ancient Greek. Before I talked about epsilon iota, how that changed, as well as zeta, rho, upsilon, phi theta chi, and now let's talk about eta. Some of my sources include Greek, A History of the Language and Its Speakers by Horrocks, Medieval and Early Modern Greek by Holton Horrocks et al., Vox Graeca and Vox Latina by Allen, and The Pronunciation of Greek and Latin by Sturdivant. The links to these books on Amazon are in the description. A very important author I'm adding to these lists today is Theodorson, who wrote The Phonemic System of the Attic Dialect, 400 to 340 BC, and The Phonology of Attic in the Hellenistic Period. Also see Threet, The Grammar of Attic Inscriptions, and Gignac, A Grammar of the Greek Papyri of the Roman and Byzantine Periods, which deal with the inscriptional evidence in great detail. Now in video essays like this about ancient phonology, I love to talk a little bit about the modern language that has descended from the ancient language. In this case, the modern Greek letter ita. It's pronounced e. In fact, all of these letters are pronounced e. In modern Greek. These letters and graphemes all experience something called iotacism, or even eticism, based off of that name eta, the letter eta in modern Greek pronunciation. Naturally, all six of these graphemes had pretty different pronunciations in antiquity, but how and when did they change? We've already talked about epsilon iota, that digraph, and we've also talked about upsilon. So what about eta? When did eta become eta? Let's do a quick review of the Greek language periods. Now, these are relatively arbitrary. They're based off of historical and political events, but they are useful for understanding the different phases of the Greek language, especially in the literature. So, modern Greek begins, again, arbitrarily, circa 1450. That's the fall of Constantinople. That's the end of the Eastern Roman Empire. Now, before that, we have medieval or Byzantine Greek, and that starts around the year 600. Everything before that is a different language called ancient Greek. Now, the later forms of ancient Greek do have a lot of similarities with the Byzantine or medieval Greek, and medieval Greek has a lot of similarities with modern Greek, but ancient Greek is all considered to be essentially one grammatical system, even though it has lots of different phonologies associated with it. Ancient Greek is subdivided into Koine, that goes all the way back to 350 BC approximately, right around when Alexander the Great was born, and then before 350, all the way back to 500 BC, that's known as the Classical Greek period, and the most important literary dialect that was flourishing at the time was the Classical Attic dialect, so a century and a half, 500 BC to 350 BC. And everything before that is pre-classical, including Homer's famous epics, which were written down around the year 800 BC. 
Koine has two subdivisions as well. The first part, starting with Alexander the Great and his Hellenization of much of the Eastern Mediterranean, is called the Hellenistic or Hellenistic Koine period. And that goes to when Greece and Egypt are absorbed into the Roman state into the Roman Empire, and then it's called Roman Koine. By the way, in modern Greek, the pronunciation of Koine is Gini. It means common. It's from the ancient Greek word Koine. Modern Greeks like to remind us how the words are pronounced in modern Greek. Of course, modern Greek pronunciation is not the same as ancient Greek pronunciation, and that's something I'm going to demonstrate again in this video. So how was the letter eta pronounced in the ancient language. Well, let's talk about Koine. In fact, let's isolate on the Koine spoken during the classical Roman period. That goes from the first century BC to the second century AD. That's when classical Latin flourishes. And since we understand the phonology of classical Latin really well, we can be very certain of the pronunciation of eta in that time period because the Romans transcribed all kinds of Greek words into Latin using the Roman alphabet. And how did they transcribe it? Well, they always transcribed it as a long letter E, pronounced E or E. Now, if you have a sensitive ear, you might be wondering, wait, how is that pronounced? Is it E or E in Latin, or Greek for that matter? Well, according to Calabrese, the late Republican pronunciation of Latin, that is the beginning of the classical period, the pronunciation was a long open E sound. This is supported by languages that derive from late Republican Latin, like Sardinian. See my in-depth video on this topic on the secondary polymathy channel, Polymathy Plus, where I talk all about lax vowels and whether they existed or not in classical Latin. By the end of the classical Roman period, however, the long open E was closing towards a true mid E and eventually towards E. And that close quality was the quality that would go into most of the Romance languages. See my Latin to Italian video for more. In any case, this grapheme, the letter E, pronounced E or E or E, this shows us that it's a front mid vowel, a front unrounded mid vowel for the ancient Greek quality of eta during the Roman classical period. And that would seem to apply to most of Koine, both to Hellenistic and to Roman Koine. For example, the Greek word for peace, well, that's actually a given name in Greek and is also known as a name in Latin. And in Latin, it's spelled like this and pronounced Irene. Now, in ancient Greek, we can be pretty certain that's the contemporary pronunciation as well, even though in ancient Greek, it's spelled like this. Now, one of the first things that'll jump out at you is that epsilon iota is not pronounced a, not in the Koine period, and in fact, not in the classical period either. You need to see my epsilon iota video if you haven't yet. Epsilon iota is just a long e sound for pretty much all of the Koine period and even part of the classical period. But the important thing that we can notice is that the letters eta are both transcribed with long e. Irene. Now, whether that was Irene or Irene or Irene, something in between isn't necessarily that important. What we can know for sure is that the eta is definitely pronounced as a front mid vowel. The other thing we can be certain about is that eta is not a short vowel, but a long vowel, a phonemic long vowel. This is commented all the time by ancient grammarians. For me, it was super easy just to go to Ovid's Metamorphosis Book 1 and find a whole bunch of Greek names there. For example, the ancient Greek name Plumene is transcribed Plumene. Because it's written in a poem, we know that the eta has to be long, but the epsilon, you can see that it's actually short. And there are thousands of examples like this all over classical Latin literature. So Latin, at least in the classical period, is regularly transcribing eta as a letter E, as the sound A. But is there ever a time that Latin transcribed it as something else? Does Latin, for example, ever transcribe the eta letter with the letter I, indicating a value E, like modern Greek? Well, the first time I really noticed this was when I was recording my trilingual audiobook, The Biblical Story of Christmas. And in that, I have the Greek and the Latin and the English. And when I was reciting Luke 2.2, 2, 
I noticed this. The original Greek was written in the 1st and 2nd centuries AD, but the Latin was translated in the 4th or 5th centuries AD. Now, here is Luke 2.2 in the Pompeian Lucian pronunciation. And if you want to learn more about that, see the link in the description or this audiobook about the judgment of the goddesses. Haute apographe prote egeneto hegemoneovontos tes surias gureniu. So Jerome's late 4th or early 5th century translation into Latin is this. Haec descriptio prima facta est a praeside sudiae curino. So that's some interesting changes. Not even curino, but curino. So there's something interesting happening with the iota. We'll talk about that another time. But the important thing is that the eta is transcribed as a long e sound. Curino instead of curino or curenio, which is what I would have expected. For the sake of simplicity, I use the classical Latin pronunciation just there, not the late Latin pronunciation, but you get the idea. Now, around the same time, 4th century, the Gothic alphabet also transcribes eta as the letter E, as an E sound, as a front mid vowel, as does Old Armenian. And there are other languages that demonstrate this too. Nevertheless, thanks to spelling errors and similar transcription differences, like in that late Latin, we know that the majority pronunciation by Byzantine times in the Greek-speaking world for this letter was, in fact, E. That is, it took on the quality that it has in the modern language by that time. So we've covered the pronunciation of letter eta in modern Greek and Byzantine Greek. Indeed, eta is certainly the best name for it then. And its value was just like the modern language by then, e. Before that, where its name was either eta or even heta, we'll talk about that another time, its value was definitely e or e, some long mid-vowel, whether true mid or close mid or open mid. We know thanks to spelling errors from the Hellenistic Koine period that the value was definitely that, e or e. And a front mid vowel is also the correct value during the pre-classical period, going all the way back to Homer's time and before, even in Attica. Attic and Ionic are two different dialects, but they have so much in common that they're often called Attic Ionic, especially with this feature that they have. Whereas other dialects, like Doric, have a long A, a long alpha, Ionic and Attic will normally make those the letter eta. For example, mater is mater. In fact, the Latin word is also mater for mother. The Attic word tlemon, meaning, oh, poor thing, that's used in the beginning of Euripides' Medea. And naturally, as happens in Greek tragedy, the Doric patina is added, and occasionally we don't just get tlemon, but when it's Doricized, it's tlamon. So for these reasons, along with all the cognates and other Indo-European languages, we can be certain not only that eta is a, a long vowel, and that it's a mid-vowel, but that it started as an a that changed to a, and then to a long open e. And that's the value that Sidney Allen gives to it in Walks Graica for the classical period, the Greek classical period, the 5th century BC, e. Interestingly, the Athenians didn't actually use eta to begin with. Actually, that letter, of course, you know, it's also called heta in antiquity, was used for the letter H sound. Since the Etruscan and the Roman alphabets come from Greek dialects that used the letter that we call eta for an H sound, well, that's why we use it for an H sound too. And that's what the Athenians were doing in the old Athenian alphabet. And they were even doing that in the classical period. However, because Ionic was the prestige dialect before Attic was, the Ionic alphabet was gaining more and more popularity with Athenians in the 5th century BC and eventually became the official alphabet in 403 BC thanks to Euclid. And in that time, into the beginning of the 4th century, we have the surging prestige of this Attic Ionic alphabet accompanying the Attic dialect the dialect of literature and philosophy and education and great plays. So in the Attic version of the Ionic alphabet, adopted officially in 403 BC, the long open E sound is represented by eta, while the long close sound, E, is represented by epsilon iota. We have further evidence of this thanks to the Boeotian dialect. The Boeotians, like pretty much everyone else in the Greek-speaking world, 
took on the Attic version of the Ionic alphabet, the Attic Ionic alphabet, and they used it to spell their words. And the sound values are the same for each one of these letters. Eta stands for E, Epsilon Iota stands for E, and Iota stands for E. But cognate words are spelled differently. Gai in classical Attic pronunciation, well in Boeotian, it's spelled Ge. What does this show us? It shows us that Boeotian has monophthongized. It did something that would happen much later in Koine, many centuries later. So Kai is Ge. Classical Attic Pater is Patir in Boeotian. So instead of being E, it's E. And Eki in Classical Attic is Eki in Boeotian. So Boeotian went through a vowel shift, but they used the alphabet as it was pronounced in Athens the exact same way for the same phonemes. Thus, they spelled things differently. So we know exactly what the sound values are supposed to be for these letters, including eta, which would have to have a more open quality since there was a more closed front vowel that was a closed mid E for epsilon iota. And even though the Boeotian dialect had developments that look like what would happen to Koine much later, they weren't necessarily the origin. And in any case, they proved that classical Attic pronunciation did have the diphthong i, and it did have a long open e sound for eta, and that's what we're after. Or does it? Absolutely. For the most conservative variants of classical Attic pronunciation. But that wasn't the only one. Over on the secondary channel, Polymathy Plus, I just published a very in-depth look at a work by Theodor Son, which he wrote in 1978. And in this, he statistically analyzes all of the spelling errors in Attic, starting from pre-classical through classical and in all of the Hellenistic centuries, and determines some pretty amazing stuff. You definitely want to go check out that video on Polymathy Plus, but here is a preview. While the open pronunciation of eta along e probably existed in some conservative dialect voices, the majority conservative pronunciation was probably already a for the entire classical period. That is, it had already closed, in spite of what the spelling system would seem to indicate to us. The spelling system is representing how the most conservative speakers were pronouncing things. More than that, the conservative subsystem was accompanied by an innovative subsystem, and they were in competition. The conservative speakers that changed a to a got this from the innovative subsystem. Now, the innovative speakers actually already changed a to e as early as 500 BC. And this was the more popular pronunciation. Most Attic speakers in the classical period were pronouncing eta as e, like modern Greek. But it gets even weirder. This subdialect the innovative popular one also pronounced epsilon as e, and that is nothing like modern Greek. It's one of many bizarre innovations in that subdialect that have no connection with modern Greek at all, even though they, by coincidence, might resemble it with some features, like the fact that eta was e. Now let's take the word for day. In the conservative pronunciation of classical Attic, that would be Hemira. But the majority conservative subdialect people were probably already saying Hemira. They had a closed long vowel. And probably the most popular pronunciation of all was in fact Hemira. That is, both of those E vowels were actually E vowels. Hemira. Note also that the aspirate, the H sound, was still completely pronounced in classical Attic, even in the innovative subsystem. All of this stuff is mind-blowing. You have to go check out that long, in-depth video on the secondary channel. One more tantalizing thing, the Y was also pronounced E in the subdialect. Go, go see the video. But then something really strange happens. All of this gets overturned. With the death of democracy, so also dies this innovative subdialect. The flourishing democracy that happened in the classical period seems to have permitted the prestige of the innovative subdialect, and it just spread like wildfire. It became incredibly popular with almost everyone. Something happened like that with the non-rhotic pronunciation in Britain. 
It started out as a lower class thing that was only associated with people near London saying ka instead of car. But now that is the most prestige sound in England. And only people that have a dialect like mine happen to preserve that older pronunciation that is rhotic. So what happened? Well, democracy died. And the death of democracy extinguished almost every aspect of the innovative subsystem. The more closed pronunciation of eta as e, well, that remained even in the most conservative speakers. But the e pronunciation, especially for epsilon, that went away completely. For how and why that occurred, what historical events made that possible, you're going to have to see the video on the secondary channel. So that's the story of how eta went from a to a to e to e to e. Thanks again to the Ancient Language Institute for supporting the video and Caritas Polas Oida to all of my Patreon supporters. Walete kai hugiainete.